Now we have three speakers waiting to address you. But first, I'd like to invite Professor Arti Kalro to tell you more about them. She's from the Shailesh Mehta School of Management and has research interests in advertising and persuasion, integrated marketing communication, media studies, and green marketing. She teaches the Tata Fellows in the Pro Seminar courses in subjects like technology, design, and end to end innovation. Arti. Thank you, Gayatri. A very warm evening, and welcome to the final session of the day where we have three short talks by three excellent speakers that we've chosen for you. So the very first speaker here, Professor Chetan Solanki, is from the Department of Energy Science and Engineering here at IIT Bombay. He specializes in solar cell technologies and systems. His larger objective in life is to create self-sustaining solar ecosystems for off-grid electricity solutions through localization and rural entrepreneurship. His Solar Urja Lamp project, which is also known as the Soul Project, which was started in Rajasthan, received the Prime Minister's Award in April 2017. He has won IIT Bombay's Young Investor, Investigator Award in 2009, the European Material Research Society Young Scientist Award in 2003, and he has over 100 research papers in the area of solar photovoltaics and four US patents to his credit. He's currently leading two key projects of national importance, sponsored by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy by the Government of India. As an entrepreneur, Professor Solanki founded the Keyword Solutions Private Limited in 2013, which was initially incubated at SIGN at IIT Bombay. This Keyword Solutions provides engineering and design service for rooftop and ground-mounted solar PV systems, but more importantly, entrepreneurship training in rural areas. Professor Solanki, the stage is yours. Okay, good. So, good evening to all of you. Uh, can you have some lights off? So, what I'm going to talk to you is about, uh, uh, as the topic says, a solar ecosystem uh, by local for local, uh, and it's nicely acronymed as CEL. And that uh, we need to do this because uh, we need, uh, it's about the providing energy access to people. So, what I'm going to talk to you is about uh, electricity access and the limitations of the grid to reach everyone uh, in the country and in the world, and uh, how we can provide the solar solution through localization. Uh, and then uh, eventually I'll come to the point uh, of the, uh, the discussion today, the solar ecosystem by local for local. So uh, let me start already with the uh, energy access, and it, I think it is very well defined by the Sustainable Development Goal uh, 7. Uh, that uh, energy, uh, we should ensure access to the affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy to all of By 2030, this goal has to be achieved. And if you look at overall, there are like uh, uh, 17 sustainable goals and 178 targets. And this map uh, nicely published in the Nature recently, nicely uh, connects the sustainable goal 7, that energy access with 178 targets. So you can see that out of 178 targets, almost 125 targets that are related to education, health, uh, uh, economic, uh, skill development, a uh, lot of things are connected with energy. And therefore, it is utmost important to provide the energy access uh, to uh, all uh, with all these parameters, reliable, clean, modern, sustainable, all those solutions. So how to go about this? So before you go about, I mean, let us listen. What is? Let us find out what is the size of the problem. And in our government is putting a lot of efforts in providing energy access, uh, but it's still up 70 years of independence. After 70 years of independence, we still have 220 million people not having uh, connection with the grid. Almost 500 million people who still use wood and coal and charcoal and animal waste for the cooking. And uh, uh, I must mention here that uh, the consumption of energy generation and consumption, the way we do uh, with the fossil fuel, also significantly affect, affect the climate change. So there are, these are the challenge in front of us. And if you look at the world, it is much bigger problem. In, in all over the world, there are 1.1 billion people still not connected with the grid. And about uh, uh, 3 billion people still use uh, conventional cooking, the, the wood-based cooking or the coal-based cooking. 
So these are big challenges and uh, we know there are a lot of efforts uh, that are being put, uh, uh, particularly uh, for providing electricity. India has actually done uh, very significantly in the last uh, 5 to 10 years and a lot of people are getting access. However, the problem of providing access, uh, uh, the, these are the three main problems. One is how much time it is going to take to provide the access. You know? We are already 70 years are gone and how much more time it is going to take. At what cost you are going to provide the access. Uh, and as we go you know, uh, to the more difficult geographical areas, as we go to the less densely populated uh, areas, as we go to the less economically uh, active, economic activity area, the cost of providing electricity becomes higher and higher. And the third question is, uh, even if you provide some electricity access, it, is, there, uh, is the quality of electricity and the reliability of electricity is good enough or not? So basically there are three parameters which any energy solution, whether it is uh, coal based electricity or whether it's a diesel based or it's a renewable or wind or solar, any solution that you want to offer today, uh, we believe must fulfill this criteria. And the time is one important criteria. It has to be you know, quick in order to provide that. And we believe that whatever is happening, and if you look at the, the problem with the electricity access and the power cuts and the load shading and the voltage down and frequency change and all, that, that the issues remains and the, the Prayas in, in Pune is doing fantastic work to you know, uh, collect those data. So the even question is whether solar technology can, uh, uh, can be a solution. And again, when I solution, actually the solar technology also should meet all this criteria that it has to be timely, it has to be cost effective and it has to be of good quality and reliability. So as I said, there are a lot of organizations in the country which are working. So for example, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy is one of the first of a kind of ministry in the country which is set up in 1980s. And uh, a lot of nodal agency working under that. There is a rural electrification corporation. There is whole set of uh, uh, NGOs, you know, uh, very uh, large size NGOs are working in providing access. Uh, but it has not been achieved, and you know, still, as I said, there are 200 million people are, uh, are uh, using uh, uh, kerosene lamp uh, based electric uh, lighting solution. So one of the things that we have realized in the work that we have been doing at IIT Bombay is typically there is a lack of holistic approach in the project implementation, and uh, I would fa uh, focus and emphasize on the local skill employment, uh, no entrepreneurial activities at the local level. I think this affects in a major way, and I'll come back to this once again. Another problem is that a uh, lot of these projects that are driven are always kind of program driven or the subsidy driven or the charity based model. As a result of that, this, the dimension or the size of those projects is never enough to solve uh, the energy supply problem forever and they always remain as a temporary solution but not a permanent and reliable solution. So, uh, so can we actually have a market based approach, can we have holistic approach is yes, what is the whole idea. Also what we have, uh, when we started working, we have looked at the entire, uh, uh, what we call electricity ladder, then what are your needs of electricity and it, and it starts at a very little electricity which is required for the you know, small lighting and uh, for example, if you compare with the kerosene lamp, really, really very like 5 lux of light that is uh, required at that level. But you can go to the next level and provide the complete lighting for the entire house, you can go to the next level and provide uh, electricity for basic comfort, TV, fan, go to the next level. Uh, provide electricity for irrigation and go to the next level and you provide the complete electricity for the production purposes. How we are going to achieve this and uh, uh, how a solar solution can provide that. So uh, after a lot of uh, thinking and, and observing what is happening uh, in, the, in the sector for providing electricity, uh, we have come up with this solution uh, what we call as a last model. So localization, affordability and saturation. So these are the key challenge, uh, these are the key parameter or, this, or I would say these are the key pillars if you want to provide energy access. I will not go into the details about it. We have uh, written about, uh, about it and there are papers which are available. But uh, basically what we mean is that if you can involve local community uh, in every operation of providing energy access, which includes you know, uh, maybe assembly, providing service, selling services, you know, selling products, uh, everything that is required to provide energy solution, if everything can be done by local community, that is great, going to sustainable. However, if you need to saturate that area, otherwise you will not get economy of scale and your solution is going to be expensive. So you must do the saturation, which we mean by you know, high scale operation. And whatever solution you provide must be affordable. And so basically these are the you know, three challenges I mentioned earlier, the time, cost, quality. And to beat those challenges, uh, we have come up with this localization, affordability and saturation. 
The next question is whether we can really provide 24 by 7 power within solar solution and whether off-grid solar solution can do that or we always rely on the electricity uh, solution in the form of the grid. And as I told the grid uh, extension is expensive of here, the maintenance of the grid is expensive of here and generating and feeding to the grid, uh, you need people, you need uh, uh, other resources, so it is expensive of here. So we have been uh, uh, watching the technology and coming myself from a, a, a PV, uh, I did my PhD in PV technology, so closely watching what is happening. So there has been a lot of uh, advancement that has happened in technology and that is actually enabling the paradigm shift in the solar uh, solution that can be offered. And I just will give a quick example here. Of course, you all know that what LED has done in terms of the lighting and how the uh, efficiency of the LED has resulted in the uh, resulted in the lower size of the panels, lower battery. But same thing is available in other cases also. For example, uh, so if you look at any solar solution, you you need you have loads, so lamps, fans, TVs, etc. You have batteries and electronic controls, and your solar PV module. What is happening in technology? The PV module cost has been uh, no, significantly come down, and it is always going down. The the economy, uh, the scale of the production has really uh, gone almost exponentially, and the prices are in the uh, in the range of uh, half a dollar per watt, uh, kind of, which is really really attractive prices. Look at the loads. For example, this is 23.6 inch TV. Uh, uh, the LBNL uh, you know, conducts it or um, this competitions to provide the best efficient loads. Uh, this TV consumes 9 watt, 10 watt, 11 watt power depending on what mode you are operating. There are fans which are like you know uh, wall mounted fan which works at a 7 to 9 watt. There are ceiling fan which can work at 25 watt and so on. So when your loads are so low, what will happen is you can actually have a lower battery size that is required to fulfill your load and you will have lower module size. As a result of that what will happen your entire system size it will go down. Now what, what can we do is now we use this opportunity to actually over design your system. You actually use extra battery, extra panel so that even if it is a rainy season, if it is a cloudy season, even if the dust is not clean very uh, 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 frequently, your system is still guaranteed to work. So whenever you you uh, press a button, your system should work uh, 24 by 7, uh, you know, all the time. And that is what is required uh, to bring the reliability in the solar solution, which otherwise people do not have faith and people are always looking for it. So great, I mean, this is the, the background and uh, in order to fulfill this, uh, as I said, we need to have a market driven model, we need to have a holistic approach, we need to have local community involved into it, we need to have affordable solution. So in order to bring everything together, uh, we have evolved certain concept at IIT Bombay uh, based on the experiment that we are doing it. Uh, so before I come to that, I'll, uh, let me tell you that we have already implemented a program for uh, using local community through the local community for 1 million student uh, solar study lamp and right now we are implementing a 7 million lamp program. So what are the concepts that we evolved here? One is of course as I mentioned the three main pillars of any such technology based implementation is the localization affordability saturation. Other thing is we, because we are talking about the involvement of a rural community and therefore we believe that the technology or the lack of knowledge of technology should not become a bottleneck and therefore we started working on what we call as open source hardware. So whether whatever solar product that you are talking about, whether we can design it, test it, try it and release in a public domain so that anybody in the world uh, can have access and if you want to scale up the program in a huge scale uh, in the country outside you can do that. So that's another thing that we are doing it. What are the contribution that technology institutions like IITs can do is uh, is to have a what is what we call the technology upscaling center. So a lot of technology which which you must have been discussing yesterday today, uh, which are really of great use. But there's a there's a gap between where it becomes commercially viable and where it is a prototype, and that gap can be fulfilled by uh, you know centers like this. So based on this, we started a solar lamp program, solar urja lamp program. We call it. Uh, 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 where all these concepts are utilized, we have uh, we use local community to do the program. We have the open source hardware design. So the solar lamp design that we use right now is available to public and anybody can manufacture it. And we have done the uh, earlier the, uh, the scaling up it. Then next level we have the solar enterprising, which is how to provide 24 by 7 power for all your needs. So it is not only the solar lamp, but whether we can run solar ten, uh, solar fan, solar TV, solar street light, and everything. Again, through the local uh, involvement of local community. So, right now, as we are talking, uh, we are doing this experiment where uh, we are trying to provide 24 by 7 power to either the person or household who do not have any access, 
or the person or household who is having access to electricity but willing to get the connection go. I mean, so basically, whole idea of that we can provide better affordable quality. So in fact, we have given this slogan and we are working on it is, is solar lagao, bijli katao, paisa bachao. Because your solar solution, uh, it is reliable anytime it is going to work. So it can actually beat the, the, the electricity bill that people are paying and uh, getting unreliable electricity. So solar enterprising and eventually if you really want to be sustainable solution, so the concept that we have come up with as a, as a, uh, as a topic today is a solar ecosystem by local for local. In fact, uh, over a period of time, we have modified it a little bit. It is not solar ecosystem, but it is sustainable energy ecosystem by local for local. So tomorrow, if you want to provide a cooking solution to everyone, whether local community itself can get involved and, and do the entire solution. So basically, that is the, the whole idea that we are working uh, on here. So as I said, this is not only the concept that has, that has been evolved, but this concept have evolved based on the experience that we are having uh, while working with the community, while working with the technology, while working with the design. So first pro project that we did is a million solar Ruja lamp project, where we did one million uh, student, we have provided the lamp, where the local community did the every operation, the local assembly, the cells to the community, the students in the school, and the repair and maintenance was also uh, uh, free for one year. So this is all done by community. Now it was a successful program, however we have realized and so based on that we have promote, we proposed to the government that why don't we have a program where in two years of time we provide this study lamp to everyone uh, across the country and we, we call it a right to light kind of initiative and uh, government was very receptive and they have funded a project where uh, we are right now implementing 7 million. However one thing that we have learned from our earlier program is that Without this program, the sustenance of the activity in the solar was not there. And therefore, while we are doing 7 million, we have come up uh, with the idea that whether we can add localized enterprising also into it, so that without the intervention of the uh, institute, the uh, solution, uh, the, the complete solar solution uh, activities and the repair and maintenance cells should continue. So we added into that. But then we started thinking if you only do the enterprising, if you only assemble the product and sell it to the community, a uh, lot of money that is uh, there uh, goes in the buying and selling of the product actually goes out of the rural economy, right? So for example, if you're buying a 10,000 rupee system, the, the service addition for the assembly, distribution, repair, maintenance may be 30%, 40%, but 60% money is going to somewhere who's actually manufacturing it. So the next level idea that we are trying is whether we can locally manufacture also, not everything, but whatever is feasible. And a lot of technology solutions that are uh, required, which can solve the problem, are the very locally feasible solution. So the next project that we have done for which we have got the Prime Minister Award also is where not only we did the assembly of solar lamps, not only that uh, the women there started solar shops, but they are also now manufacturing uh, solar PV modules. And as I'm talking right now, this two megawatt uh, peak factory is actually operational. 54 women are owning the factory and also running the factory. So everything is done, uh, is, is done that way. So this is how, I'm um, just a uh, couple of pictures that I want to show. This is how we start our project where we train the local community and mainly the women uh, to assemble the product uh, and they do all operation of it. Uh, so whenever we do this kind of project in the local community, the, the first doubt comes in everybody's mind is whether they will be able to meet the quality standard. When we talk about manufacturing, the first doubt that comes in the mind of people, whether they'll be uh, doing the quality work or not. And, and let me tell you here that uh, absolutely quality is not a problem. Of course, we need to you know, put effort so that we do that. And we do six level quality checks right from the supply of the component from the vendor side before it dispatches. While it delivers, every component get uh, tested and get uh, uh, checked. And then only it goes to the part of assembly. When the assembly happens, again they test it. And then in parallel to that, we also do the testing at the laboratory level. So there's a lot of quality checks and balances are there because that is the base of it. And this, of course, student gets a light. And this is a photograph uh, where this uh, uh, Durga factory or Durga energy, where the module is being manufactured uh, by the women. And the entire factory is run by the women only. Uh, so this is a very recent photograph where we are doing this. So now coming back to the cell. So when we want to everything localize, you know, what do we mean by cell? So sustainable energy ecosystem by local for local. First of all, the this is also an, another ecosystem, like we have biological ecosystem, we have water ecosystem. So uh, this is also energy ecosystem. So what happens in an ecosystem? There are many stakeholders. 
and every stakeholders are uh, acted upon and get affected by other stakeholders. So therefore, the, all the stakeholders in the cell has to be properly uh, kind of planned and worked together in order to get the des desired result. So what we are trying to do is uh, involving various stakeholders that are that can be part of the cell, the cell cell groups, uh, the cluster level federation, the the Krishi Vigyan Kendra, uh, the private firms, private entrepreneurs now. However, the basic feature of all this uh, economic uh, institution should be that they work for the local and they primary, primarily contribute to the local economy. So, when we establish the cell, as I said, this is a complete ecosystem and all concept, all elements of ecosystem should be part of it. So, the various ecosystem element that we identified you know, should actually include the range of it. Like in, in our mobile phone service that we use, there is, a, there is somebody who is providing the selling the mobile phone, there is somebody who is providing the bandwidth, there is somebody who is providing the repair services, there is somebody who is providing the cover, there is somebody who is providing the you know, mobile charger and all kind of things. So, similar way, uh, the energy ecosystem also should comprise of all those elements where there is a user, there is a provider, there is a service provider, there is a seller, there is a financing uh, organization uh, uh, and all those things. So, the cell in our uh, idea should have the uh, awareness building, the financial services, uh, the entrepreneurship and skill building the supply chain uh, management, the demand aggregation, uh, uh, after sales, repair, maintenance, training and all. So, these are the various components that we should have and each of the cells should interact from the outside community. So, uh, basically in terms of the you know getting component from outside, uh, working with the manufacturers, working with the financial institutions and so on. So, basically this is the one cell uh, that can provide the energy solutions uh, in the local community. And the Dungarpur is one of the best example uh, where we have been working. As I said, there are local communities which are, you know, the self-help groups can finance themselves uh, to buy the solar product. Uh, there are people who establish the solar shops. Uh, uh, there are people who are manufacturing the solar product. There are people who are providing the repair services. So, one cell is already kind of evolving in the Rajasthan. But what benefits it brings together uh, is, uh, first of all, the global and the local synergies together. So, what is the idea of involving local community? Because your services are going to be cheaper, faster, better. So, therefore, these are the benefits of being local which cannot be provided and offered by any, you know, corporate or any big company or any centralized organization cannot provide you the same services uh, in the, in, at the lowest cost that a local person can provide you. So, that is a benefit. Uh, on the other hand, if you can, you know, do the demand aggregation everything, you can also get the benefit of the global where the quality of the products, economy of scale and branding you can get it. So, these are the benefits the cell provides and, and what, we, what it will do is it will shift the, the whole service of providing energy in the form of program to a market driven. And if that happens, it will be great. As I said, uh, we are already working on it. Uh, we are experimenting uh, right now in our 7 million project to establish a cell. Uh, Dungarpur is an example of it. We are, we are having solar, solar houses where 24 by 7 power is provided. There are experience center being established. There are solar shops. There is a network. There's a company uh, which is, you know, putting all solar shop together and uh, under umbrella to give them the economy of scale. There's a module manufacturing factory already operating, and to help them, there is a financing institution, there's a training institution, awareness, confidence building, market stimulation. All these things are being done. What I'm, uh, <coughs> so you can get the more details about the project that is happening on the uh, the Souls IITB dot in. Here you can uh, get the details. So the whole idea is this is one successful experiment that is happening, and it is really a uh, sustainable on its own. It can provide you cost effective, complete, affordable, reliable, modern energy solution as I started with. And the whole idea is to actually establish these cells not at one side, but if you can have one cell at every corner of the country uh, so, so that uh, you know, the, we can provide the energy access in a, in a very uh, quick time and sustainable manner. So that is what is our proposal that we are talking to the Niti Aayog and uh, uh, giving them, uh, we are giving them proposal uh, about Establishing cells everywhere in the form of what we call the National Energy Access Board. So there are 703 districts, so we can establish 703 cells everywhere. And not only that, uh, this concept can also be applicable to any developing countries where energy access is one of the uh, one of the key challenge uh, in the modern times. So with this, I would like to end. People are ready to do it. And thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Solanki. We have time for one question. Any question? Yeah. I'm curious, what is the overarching business model of management structure that ensures that cells come from China, the market actually sells come from China, the fact that the company some are permanent institutions brought together, and then in the end that this brand is managed to certain quality standards and standards. So what's the actual organizational structure that makes it happen? 
Right. So, uh, as I said, it's it's not one organ. There are many institutions which which has to you know either which are either there or we need to establish them. So, for example, one side is there has to be financing of the uh, the whole thing happening. Now, financing also required at the local level where user is buying, trying to buy it. The shopkeeper who is trying to sell the product, they also does, do not have money. And even the manufacturer, if somebody already wants to go it. In terms of the quality now, uh, in the cell, uh, what we envisage is to begin with, we may not buy everything, uh, we, we may buy everything from outside. But there are very feasible technologies. For example, the, the solar module manufacturing is nothing but a lamination, right? That is how we laminate a paper. But if you, you know, extend it a little bit, uh, if you laminate a solar cell, it becomes a solar module manufacturing. If you want to manufacture a plastics, for example, which becomes a casing for all these boxes, it's not a very complicated, the, the, uh, the plastic molding is a very well-known technology that can be done. And therefore, once you design the capacity building properly and all the checks and balances, you can ensure that the quality is also maintained. The good part about the cell is that everything is local stakeholders and local people uh, are supposed to manage. Therefore, your cost of service, time to service is, is, is uh, very fast and very low cost. And therefore, uh, we believe that only in this way you can provide energy access uh, in a sustainable manner. Otherwise, the grid extension to every part, we know that the technology, even the solar technology has come down very significantly. The cost of per unit solar electricity is less than uh, 3 rupees, which is bid in India. And if you go to Peru and Chile, the cost is even lower. But despite this lower cost of technology, we do not see access to everyone. So once we, once we look at the access to the people which are not connected yet, I think the ball game is very different than we are providing access to the, the urban areas and the, and the uh, industrial area. So that is what we believe that the cell kind of concept can help to fulfill this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have Mr. Prabhat Pani. He heads partnerships and technology platforms at the Tata Trust. Mr. Pani is the head, as I mentioned, at the Tata Trust for partnerships and technology platforms. He has also been key in leading various programs at the Trust, like Delta, which takes care of data evaluation, learning technology, and analysis. He has been associated with the Tata Trust since 2016, January. Prior to his current role, Mr. Pani was the project director for the Tata Water Mission. He has, ha he has an extensive portfolio of rich experience in the field of management. He has served as the executive director of Taj SATS Air Catering, Chief Operating Officer in Tata Teleservices Limited. He's been the director of Roots Corporation Limited. He's an alumnus of Bits Pilani and I am Ahmedabad. He's going to be talking to us today about sustainability initiatives. Mr. Pani, the floor is yours. Extremely important that any organization actually keep touch with what's happening to society. And in India, where the role of the government is, in a sense, overarching, it's also important to figure out what the priorities are of the government and make sure that what you're doing are aligned because that's one way of making sure that what you do ends up getting scaled. So while I was just waiting uh, for this talk to start, I saw the very apt topic, innovate to transform. And it also struck me that many times to innovate, you need to transform. And in a sense, some of the things which are happening in the Tata Trust, and I know it's not anything very new because of a very large proportion of the people sitting here directly connected to the Tata centers, and therefore presumably you know what Tata Trusts are all about. But I felt it was important to also give you a sense about some of the different things which are happening there, because that, in a sense, would also help you determine the kind of work that you would like to do uh, both in the projects that you're doing now as well as some of the other work that you would like to pursue in future. And one indication of even the part that I spoke about, about transform to innovate, are even the roles that I have played in this period of two odd years. I moved in from a for-profit background. I was fortunate in having worked uh, the first few years in fast-moving consumer goods. Then I was in telecom for about 10 years, and then in uh, hospitality, of which a very exciting period was as CEO of Ginger Hotels. And then I said, I need to do something different. And I started looking at water and sanitation. Within a short period, because the organization, which is Tata Trust, 
was doing a whole lot of things in the area of digitization, data, analytics. I moved into that space. And barely six, seven months back, I was told that there was need to look at, start looking at technology and start looking at partnerships. Because that is what would actually provide the impetus for doing the kind of things that we'd like to do going forward. And that's really what this presentation is all about. Why technology? And what can technology do even in the social sphere? So let me quickly, even though you may know this, start with an overview. Is there a sound? in about seven odd critical themes of engagement, healthcare, energy and climate change, rural upliftment, education, media arts and culture, urban poverty, alleviation, water and sanitation. Many of these are really the programs that you work with in the data centers. So how is it done? Using institutions or working in partnership with institutions, providing individual grants, uh, just to mention the the oldest part of the Tata Trust, the JN Tata Endowment Fund, which has been focusing on giving individual grants, is now 126 years old. It predates many of the other foundations that you know of. And therefore, what this means is that of the 900 projects which are being taken across India in many of the themes that I spoke about and, and some of the older themes too, the whole focus is upon building platforms, looking at innovation and building platforms, and then looking at partnerships. Some of these platforms actually guild, get built with the partners coming in, and some of them provide now the base on which others can come in and uh, contribute towards this huge impact that is possible. A few slides on what technology can do to the kind of interventions and programs that we get involved in. First, very clearly, is all about scale. If you have to impact 100 million lives, then you cannot do programs and projects which are touching one district. You just heard a reference. There are 703 districts in the, in the country. And there are some districts which are even tougher to get across to. Look at parts of the Northeast. Look at parts of 
what is called the Central India Corridor, many of which are invest, infested, unfortunately, with so-called extremists and Maoists, primarily because economic activity is abysmally low, which fosters the ground for all kinds of other activities to come in there. Clearly, bringing in cost reduction and performance improvements, the ability to even measure to get a sense of what kind of outputs are, are coming out, what kind of outcomes are being generated, what are the impact parameters which will actually make a difference to the lives of people. That can only come about if you have good technological means available, which is all about project monitoring and review. And therefore, in all the key programs and themes that I spoke about, we are either already at, at the stage of using many of the technologies which are mentioned here. Some of them are in pilot stage, and some of them are currently at the stage where we are discussing with potential partners the ability to bring that in. Uh, some direct, some indirect. Just to give you an example, MIT has entered into this large partnership with IBM Watson to focus upon artificial intelligence. So while we have the relationship with MIT, we are also speaking to IBM Watson to see what they can do. There is a huge cancer project that we are getting into. There is a huge healthcare project we are getting into, which could really gain from bringing in AI into whatever we do. We are talking to them and seeing how this could fructify into a partnership, which will have a far greater impact. Uh, and clearly, in terms of the actual programs, there are huge gains from data and analytics. And I will give you some examples of this. And the critical part here is not being able to just do this in a small program, in a small project, but the ability to look at how this project could be scaled up and become nationally relevant. I've, I will just speak to you and give you an example of one such program where currently we are in discussions with the Niti Aayog. And clearly, the skills which are required stretch well beyond the typical assumption that people come in only with a social sector background. I have two of my colleagues from the technology team sitting right here. One of them is an MTech from IIT Kanpur, and the other is a, a product of IIT Delhi. There is scope for folks from here to also come in there. So clearly, the skills which are required if you have to design programs of this nature and if you have to implement them, require different kinds of skills, some within the organization and some as an extension of the organization, and which is where the Tata Centers come in. The best, the brightest of minds coming together, both professors as well as research scholars, and being able to work in tandem with an organization like Tata Trust to find solutions which will not only help impact positively the lives of Indians, but hopefully some of these can also be taken across to other geographies which may need them equally well. Uh, just a sense of some of the things that have been looked at by the technology team. It's a fairly new part of the organization, not to say that technology was not being looked at, but those were earlier being looked at within themes. So the water and sanitation folks used to look at the water and sanitation related technologies and so on and so forth. We're trying to now make them more systematic by bringing them together and trying to see technologies which may have wider applications, almost like horizontals across the various programs that we have. And now let me quickly move on to two programs uh, which will give you a sense about how technology can actually transform lives, how innovation can transform. If you typically look at the governance structure in India, and this applies to many parts of the world, you really the problems that you have is that the people who are involved in the process of governance have a very small toolkit. They have very few things to help them make the right decisions. What does this mean? The allocation between the requirements and what is made available to fulfill those needs, there is a wide gap. First is there is an improper assessment of what the needs are. Second, there is an improper allocation of the resources that you have for purposes of meeting those needs. And then you have insufficient, poor public delivery systems. There are leakages. It does not happen in time. 
and therefore a project which is supposed to get completed in let's say 24 months time spins over into 36 months or longer leading to all kinds of issues like cost overruns and the likes of them. All of this really means reduced development outcomes. So what's the solution to this? The solution clearly is can we change the way this whole value chain operates? Can you start with technology enabled data collection so very quickly you are able to gather and make a more proper assessment of what the needs are. People participate and you get a sense of what they need. Collate them quickly, analyze them. Look at previous figures if you have, look at figures of any other comparable geography that you have to see if it makes sense. Second, strengthen the institution. There is no point if you do things outside the system because then the dependency becomes upon this outside entity. The moment the outside entity is moved away, the program quite often collapses. You have to strengthen the institution and make it capable of actually running with it after you moved away. And last, sorry, if you do this, you also need to constantly monitor what's really happening on the field in terms of the progress that is being achieved. So what we did was we picked up four districts for in, in four different parts of India on purpose. So it is Chandrapur, Normandy, Balasore and uh, Vijayawada and four different states uh, actually moved to collecting data from something like 300,000 households, 130 pieces of data and data which is collected from schools, from Anganwadis, from public health centers, whatever were the institutions which were there in all these villages. That data along with participation by the people, it was almost like a mirror being shown to them that this is what is there in your village. This is the number of elderly people that you have. This is the number of physically challenged people that you have. This is the kind of roads that you have. This is the number of wells that you have. This is the number of animals that, that you have in meaning cows and goats and whatever else that you have. And then people are asked, what do you want next? And then after the usual stuff, the answer started to come because people then realized and said, we need a road but this road can wait because drinking water is more important. So we want more money is to be put in into drinking water. When this was collated and put together, one actually took it to the block level and then to the district level to actually say this is what the people need. We understand you may not have resources for everything, but this is a prioritization in which the village or the block needs the money. And it was the same district people, the collector, the BDO, the Sarpanch, they were the people who got involved in understanding this and making a better allocation. And because this data was being collected by the people in the community who were actually given tabs, they were even able to keep track of what was really happening in terms of three months later and six months later, which also helped the district administration keep track of what changes were happening, what kind of improvements were happening in the village. So there was a linkage, let's say, with the Swachh Bharat mission. So if they had a baseline data available of how many households did not have toilets, in six months time you could figure out how many of them actually had toilets. If people didn't have LPG connections as part of the Ujjala scheme, they were actually able to uh, figure out what changes were happening. More important, they could now run directed camps. If they wanted to do something about giving Aadhaar cards, they knew exactly which households did not have Aadhaar card. There was a focused attempt at getting them on board. You wanted to give the LPG connections, you knew the people who didn't have it. And people started realizing the benefit of all of this. Those districts who had done it in a few blocks clamored and said, we want it for the whole district. States, Arunachal Pradesh said, we will give you the money. Please do this for a whole state. And this is the one that I was speaking to you, saying that we've actually gone to the Niti Aayog, and we are in discussions with them, saying, why can't the census move to being something like this. Why does the census need to be a once in 10 year exercise, static data, which you can do very little about? If you were to use data of this nature and build in systems within the community that they could update information, you would ex exactly figure out what were the development parameters which are available. Uh, so this has actually been adopted by the Maharashtra government in something called the Village Social Transformation Foundation. They picked up a thousand gram panchayats, which are among the weakest, 
and they are looking at doing uh, rapid transformation in those. The first thing they did here was actually to select a bunch of people who were trained, who have gone and collected the data. And these people are going to be there to update the data as the projects get rolled out. We felt it was not good enough to only do this exercise in the rural part. With smart cities coming up, we actually picked up three cities, Pune, Surat, and Jamshedpur, and helped them become ISO certified. So these three cities today have data which is comparable with the best with any other top city in the world in terms of availability of data. Then they said, we have the data, but we don't know what to do with the data. So we have now put city data officers, uh, uh, some of them, uh, in fact, two of them are from TCS, people who are well versed with data and analytics and all that. Now they're actually sitting with the municipal commissioner and his team in developing the right mat metrics and starting to now generate the first set of reports. How does this ward compare against that ward with regard to, let's say, solid waste management or waste segregation and stuff like that, which is helping now cities become more knowledgeable about where they fare nationally, internationally, and how do different parts of the city fare on parameters which are important in terms of quality of life. Let me now move to another program, uh, which again is a, has a very strong element of digitization in it. And the good part is while it is doing this, it's also addressing another huge issue, the gender divide, the gap between the male and the female in terms of digital literacy in rural India. Even today, despite the so-called proliferation of, of smartphones and phones in general, only one in 10 internet users in rural India is a woman. So what we did was, in a partnership with Google, we actually appointed a lady from the community called the Internet Sathi, who got trained, who was given a smartphone and a tab. She, in turn, over the next six to eight months, spent time with women alone. I mean, the only deviation was occasionally they went to schools. So there were some young children also which got covered, and covered roughly 600 to 800 women in terms of giving them digital literacy. And all that she got paid during this period was a small honorarium to basically cover her costs of travel. Because in addition to her own village, she quite often covers two or three adjoining villages. These are the current numbers in the last two and a half years. 125,000 villages have been covered through 33,000 cities and 13 million women in 14 states have actually become digitally literate. This number by 2019 is supposed to cover half the country. India has about 660,000 villages and hopefully 36 million women. Last year, or a, a little more than a year back, when there was demonetization and there was this huge issue in rural India, these same women who incidentally get paid their salaries directly into their bank accounts, they are among the first few people to actually use ATMs and the likes of them, they were the people in the forefront going and telling people, even if you do not have cash, you can still manage. And they were actually promoting uh, uh, knowledge about financial, uh, non-cash financial systems. While this was happening, we realized it was not good enough only to create awareness. Because many of them do not have access to a phone. So three months post the training, they would actually be back to virtually square one. So we said, why can't we convert these ladies into actually digital entrepreneurs? So we moved to a Section 8 company. And the target of this company is that 100,000 women digital entrepreneurs should be in place by 2022. And out of using digital means alone, they should earn 100,000 rupees a year. Keep in mind that for many of them, the household income for a year today is 30 to 40,000 rupees. And this is what it is aiming for. 
and the first few pilots have shown that this is very, very doable. The organization has already been formed, and as we speak, is recruiting people. And the big difference is, I mean, I know from my experience, not only in the last two years in the trust, but even in the period before that. Unfortunately, what the man earns does not go to the family. Only a part of it goes to the family. What is earned by the woman quite often goes fully into the family. So this is what actually makes a difference to and makes an impact upon the lives of, like, of uh, households. So this is a Section 8 company that I spoke about. These are some of the people with whom we've already run pilots. Sorry, it's a busy slide, but this one is easier. What is this organization going to do? So you're going to have 100,000 women who will be well trained digitally. They will actually provide rural outreach for enterprises. And as I said, some of these have already started to happen. Organizations who are looking at rural marketing, where you need something to be explained. Let's pick up insurance. Insurance may come very, the concept of insurance may come very easy to you and I. It doesn't come very easy in rural India. People do not understand why they should pay. And in the case that whatever is the risk they are covering, if that does not happen, why shouldn't they get the money back? They don't understand the, the concept of claim ratios. So somebody has to help and explain this to them, that this is how it works, these are the benefits that you have, and that's how organizations like insurance companies actually need somebody of this nature. Social development activities. If a large number of government programs fail today, it is because there is inadequate amount of effort which is going in into what is called behavior change. Behavior change does not happen by putting up a poster. Behavior change happens when there is somebody you trust, speaks to you in a language that you understand, and stays with you till such time as your behavior changes. You may have an intention to change, but if you have not changed, and somebody has not kind of handheld you during that process, you will go back to exactly what was the case earlier. The fact that this lady is from a self-help group from the village, member of the community, makes a huge difference in this behavior change process. Market research in rural India, polling in rural India. Imagine somebody walking in from a city, speaking to a rural lady and checking about her, about the product she uses when she menstruates. Do you think she will ever get an answer? This lady, again, because of the level of trust that she has, is able to convey to her that what we are seeking from you is information that is going to be kept anonymous. We are only interested in figuring out whether 50 do this or 30 use that and all of that. And that's how you will get the correct answers coming in. Again, that's the kind of role the internet sati can play. And the last, of course, is assisted e-commerce. Again, these are things which come very easy to you and I. But somebody there needs to understand that if you pay upfront, there will be material which will get delivered. It may take 48 hours. It may take longer because you are in rural India. But this company is reliable, and therefore it will happen. All of this are the kind of rules. We think that this particular uh, chain of 100,000 women across India, and there is no reason why it can't be larger. This can actually end up being possibly the largest digital, digitally enabled means of reaching people in rural India over a course of time. It will not only make a difference to the lives of, to the households from where these 100,000 women come, it will make a difference to rural India. That's the thinking here. Thank you. Thank you for a uh, wonderful talk and great initiatives. Um, I had a question about, um, in the context of the recent Supreme Court judgment that said uh, privacy is a fundamental right. And uh, given, how, uh, given how operationally swamped our states and administrations tend to be, my sense is that by creating these platforms, you will also become the first people, among the first people to think about 
how to govern efficiently based on data while protecting the fundamental right to privacy of people who are already digitally removed. So, any conversations, insights about that? Well, uh, as I said um, earlier, uh, you have to, to make impact, you have to work with the government. We know that while there are areas of great strength within the government, there are also areas which are possibly not as strong. The easy way out would be to say, till these systems are perfect, we will not work. The other is to say, if we work with them, hopefully we will make them mend faster, get into place faster. And that's, I think, the role that we play. If you look at the second program that I spoke about, which incidentally also used to collect Aadhaar numbers earlier, now there's a whole bit of informed consent which has been brought in, and the whole bit about how to protect the information and data that we collect. Our partner is Google, and they possibly bring in a completely different set of standards, and possibly for the right reasons, to, to make sure that we, we, we are extremely careful about all of those things. But in the government, uh, uh, our role is certainly not only to uh, push and, and suggest that these kinds of programs be looked at, but also to try bringing in the, uh, the kind, right kind of partners and the right kind of people who can build in those safeguards and, and checks into whatever we do. But the answer clearly is not to say that only when things are perfect will we get there. I think we need to get there and we need to dirty our hands and collectively make sure that hopefully the dirt is reduced if not disappears uh, completely. We take one more question. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your wonderful insight into the program that is going on. So I just, I you mentioned about red corridor that exists in central in India and Jamshedpur where the Tata activity started, very first Tata activity started, actually is at that place. So I was wondering like all the initiative that has gone on, how much it is in that red corridor in Jharkhand, in Chhattisgarh, in Maharashtra and all those, because that's the one of the poorly developed and little insight into whatever is going on. So can you just See, traditionally the uh, Tata Trust have always identified the uh, toughest of areas to get to for no other reason that possibly the most vulnerable, the most needy people are available there, which is why you will find very extensive presence in the northeast, which happens to be another set of states which are, uh, which do not have as good infrastructure as some other parts of India and even this area that you talked about. Now, uh, clearly uh, it means things are much, much tougher uh, because you do not have necessarily a full complement of government officials available. You do not have the best officials available because the many of them are able to find, uh, you know, postings, let us say, in other locations. It just means that you have to work harder. You have to work with the community much harder. You have to work uh, and do things with far greater rigor than what you would be able to do elsewhere. But I can also say that the kind of, uh, let us say, satisfaction that it brings to the teams which work in these areas, the difference that they make to the lives of people, I think is well worth it. Thank you, Mr. Pani, for sharing the landscape of Tata structure as well as the activities and the behind the scenes, which a lot of us are not aware of. Thank you for